All right. All right, so basics of asset management. We're, this is like a real overview. Um, we'll kind of go into deeper dives down, down the road. But, um, you know, first thing you've got to do um, before you really even get your property is, is, is build a team, okay? And what goes into that team? Uh, you obviously need a, a syndication attorney, a, a lender that you're comfortable with, maybe even a couple lenders, so you're, you're competing they're, they're competing against each other. A real estate transaction attorney, which is different from a syndication attorney. Uh, a CPA to guide you. Um, you'll also, um, you know, in, in, within your team also, you, you need to make sure to close a deal, you're gonna have someone that has an, enough net worth, enough liquidity, and enough capital raising uh, ability to get a deal done. and you know, maybe if it's, it's just a real small deal, you could do it yourself. But if you're doing a, a bigger deal and you, you start need, really need to figure out that team before you're going after that, before you're going after that deal. Once you get bigger, then you could start figuring out, okay, do I need an asset manager? Do I have a VA? Do I need a, um, uh, a, an acquisitions person? So there's, you know, depending upon where you are, um, it depends on how, how, how big your team is. All right, due diligence. Um, due diligence is actually, a, you know, it's an exciting part of, of, of the deal because that, that means you have something, you know, under contract. Um, and there's a lot of pieces uh, involved in due diligence and, and certainly you, you can't do it all by yourself. Um, when we, we did our 128 uh, unit property, we had probably about, um, at least, uh, I think like 15 people from Shelton with us. There was a bunch in the room going through all of the leases. And then we broke up into three teams, uh, going, walking through every single unit. So there's a lot of people. Then you have you know, the, your HVAC person, your electrician, your roofer, you know, going through all these different uh, things on the property to make sure that you are in good shape. Now, again, on, on a much smaller property, you know, a few years ago, I was looking at a, a 12 unit. It was me, one inspector. I had a couple of specialty people out and that, and that was it, you know? So it all depends on, on the size of the property that you're going after. Any questions so far? All right, budgeting. Um, this is this is really key, and um, you know this is where you put your business plan together, uh, and it's so critical. And it's not a static. Well, it, it is static in the beginning, but you're going to change how you budget down the road. Um, but it's it's an important piece that you need your property management team on board, and typically. You know, Kyle and I will do our own budget and then ask them to do their to do their budget without seeing ours, um, because we we want it to be uh, um, separate. We don't want to influence what they're coming up with. Maybe they have higher rents or more expenses. Whatever it is, we want them to do it on their own, and then we can compare. Um, in in the budgeting, you also have your reno budget. So. You know, you're going to get bids from different companies on what they're going to be doing for you, what you need. Um, and you'll also have uh, um, your holdback from your lender in there as well. Um, and rents, when you do your budgeting, I, I see a lot of people that, uh, you know, let's say you're going to raise rents $200. You know, you can't raise your rents at, for all of them on day one. You know, it's, it takes a while. Once you get the property, you still have to give a 30 day notice or a 60 day notice, depending upon each state, um, each municipality. So it, it takes time to, to, to move rents up. And so, you know, what we might do is, you know, assume we're gonna get like half of them done in a year and it's not even gonna be at the full rent that we're pushing to because you're going to have some people that are going to stay and you might take, you know, if it, if it's a hundred dollar rent bump, you might take 50 from them or 75 from, from, uh, 
a, a, a resident that's already living there because you don't want to pay the cost to, to renovate or to change over, to turn over that unit. So uh, those are just things that you need to consider on budgeting. And again, we're sticking to, to, to high level today, but if you have questions, don't be afraid to, to ask. Yeah, type those in the chat box. And one thing Gary didn't mention is we're gonna go into each of these uh, items in detail in our future um, events. We're gonna do a six month uh, segment. So we'll probably cover three of these in detail um, next next uh, meetup and then kind of going on. So I think we've got, I don't know how many different segments we got here, but about 15. So it'll cover about five months of uh, you know asset management in detail. Yep. All right, financial analysis. This is, this is Kyle's bread and butter. Um, you've got to monitor the operating cash, the receivables, the payables. And, and it's so important that you stay on top of all this because you know, if you're just looking at your, your overall reports and you're not paying attention to the, to the real financials, you could be gunning into real hot water if you're running out of your, your cash. Um, and you also got to be looking at your budget uh, for, versus actuals, okay? So how are you performing? All right, legal, know your PPM, your private placement uh, memorandum. Um, because you're gonna make decisions based on that. So it's really important that you understand and know it. And I mean, it's a super long document. And as you get going, uh, you, don't, you don't remember it. So sometimes you're gonna have to go back in and, and check, what did we say about this? You know, what's the percentage we need to, to sell or what's, you know, how does this return of, of capital, whatever it is, you need to go back and make sure you know it. All right, KPIs, key performance indicators, so important. Actually, I posted today on social media about uh, Merrill Callister is gonna be talking about KPIs at the, at the summit. Um, and he, he's got a ton of different <laughs> businesses going on, really impressive. And he keeps track of all of them through KPIs, you know, you could see on your dashboard to see how every business is performing based on certain criteria that you set up. And um, it could be a range of different things from, you know, average unit, um, average rent per unit type, um, vacancy, how long does the renovations take, uh, you know, from um, available uh, leasing all the way to, um, whatever it is you want to track, it covers it all and you want to stay on top of it. And, and small improvements will have a huge effect on your bottom line, on your NOI. So it is so important to keep track and pay attention to all of these, uh, all your KPIs. Uh, marketing, okay, not uh, marketing is not the same in every market. You know, some people rave about Craigslist and Craigslist doesn't work in some places. Some people rave about Facebook marketplace, you know, so you've got to know your market. You got to tinker with it and see what's working, what's not working. And there may be periods when something's not working. Uh, you, you know, you just gotta, you gotta, you gotta tweak it. You gotta monitor it. You can't, if you're, if, if leasing goes down and you have more vacancy, you just got to monitor it because you could, you could burn through a lot of cash on marketing and there are in uh, efficient ways to do it. If, if you're on a busy street, like we've got these two massive banners uh, that are, are lit throughout the night on the main street and that saves us a ton of money. You know, it costs us a few hundred dollars to set up, but the, um, the amount of cars that go by there and see our banners uh, uh, about available units is, is tremendous. All right, leasing. So, you know, when you get your property, you wanna have a plan of, are you going for maximum occupancy? Are you going for maximum rent or somewhere in the middle? And, and, and Colin and I like to be somewhere in the middle. We're gonna, we're gonna push occupancy. And then once we get, you know, pretty high in occupancy, then we could push our rents. Um, but, you know, when we bought properties, um, you know, they weren't, they weren't pushing rent. So they were close to, you know, hundred percent occupancy. And, 
and you don't, you don't, you know, everyone, a lot of people think that that's, that's your goal to be at hundred percent occupancy, but not, not, not necessarily because that means you're not pushing the rent as much as it could be. So you've got to, there's a fine line. Um, so you got to keep tweaking it and playing around with it. I mean, on our weekly calls, you know, we might go up $15 and down $10 and, you know, you check your comp. So it's this constant maneuvering based on um, how many units are becoming available. And, you know, so you got to keep monitoring that. Reno management, so important. And this is definitely an area where you're going to pull your hair out a little bit because it always takes longer than they say. There's always like hiccups. Uh, and particularly now, um, a, a lot of goods comes from China. So you, you need to order in bulk. You need to order it ahead of time. Your permits take longer. I mean, I don't know if you got any, any time you call somewhere for help, they're always like COVID. Um, we can't take your call right now or this or that, you know, it's so frustrating. I, I had three of those calls today on things. So, um, you know, we, we had a, a washer dryer permit that took forever to get uh, at our last property, we started before, way before we got it. And then they kind of changed the rules on us, believe it or not. So we've been shut down from uh, installing washer dryers for, I don't know, what was it, like six weeks now, two months? Brutal. No, I think it's been, no, it's probably been three or four weeks now. Yeah, it's brutal. It's, it's you know, it's, it's setting us back from installing the washer dryers and, and charging that, that premium rent. So very frustrating. Um, and, you know, I know people that have gone and looked at, you know, bringing another cruise, are you trying to get it cheaper and at the, you know, and you, you know, it's just a constant battle trying to, trying to find, you know, cheap, good, efficient rental management. I got a quick question, Gary. So a lot of this, like the marketing, the leasing, the rental management, it sounds like a lot of what like the property manager would do. So like how much of this, do they do like some of this and you just kind of do it simultaneously to kind of, <laughs> or do you yeah, tell that's them? A, that's a great question. Things? So, I mean, Kyle and I are very, very hands-on. So, you know, Man. we're not gonna sit back and let them just run everything. Cause they, you know, your your property manager manages one property, but you know, she's got a lot of different things going on. And, um, you know, you know, we have a pretty good one. I'm, I, I like her a lot, but you know, she doesn't have a tremendous experience running a business. So we're going to monitor everything. We're going to trust, but verify our property manager, regional manager who we work with. I mean, she's got six properties pulling at her. So, you know, we, we want to stay on top of, it. we, you know, that, that, you know, extra percentile from let's say, of being pretty good to being really good is such a huge NOI driver. Um, so that's why we, we monitor everything. We stay on top of it. We push them every single week. And, um, and, and usually they're up for the challenge and they, and, and, they, and they like it. I mean, even today we got an email this afternoon from our property manager, so excited. She got a few leases uh, today and, um, you know, she communicates that because we're, we're pushing her, you know, we're pushing her to, to do better. Yeah, I, I would add that most of a, a profit in the syndication world or multifamily investment world is in that 87 to 100% occupancy. So if you're kind of hovering around that area and you as an asset manager can push it another one to 2%, I mean, that multiplies your NOI and your cash flow. So relying on a property management company to do these items is a huge mistake. That doesn't mean you need to work 40 hours a week on each property or even in general on a, on a portfolio of properties. But what you need to do is have the systems in place to hold them accountable. And like Gary said, trust, but verify. Uh, if you're not trying to improve your systems always on leasing, marketing, renovations, then you're at the mercy of the property management company to execute your business plan. And when you have investors' money at hand, that's not responsible enough, in my opinion, or in Gary's opinion. You need to continue to track and monitor them and hold them accountable. And, you know, all these things that we're talking about, they're all fine until something goes wrong, right? So if you have the greatest property management company in the world and they're doing great, 
you think you don't have to monitor this, but then when it goes wrong and you don't have these systems in place, that's when things go really bad because you need to then implement them and take the time and you can get behind three, six, nine, 12 months very quick. So we like to implement these systems, work with our property management company as, as partners in order to make sure they're in place now so that when things start to go bad, these are already triggers in place. So we already know how to identify the issues and then, you know, we don't drop off as, as drastically as others. So great question on that, but you should definitely have, you know, your hands in the mix as far as systems for your business. This is a business. This is not, you know, just investing in apartments, all fun and games. I mean, this is a multi-million dollar business that you're managing. Right. Um, so I think that ties into Canal's question. Canal, did you want to ask? I know you went unmute for a second. Otherwise, I could just read off what you wrote in the chat box. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Can you see me? <laughs> yep. What's up? <laughs> hey, good to see you all. Now, I wrote the question while Robbie asked that question. Um, I'm, I'm going to take it to, I'm going to add on to what I wrote in my question. You know, we, you pay the PM. 5%, 7%, 10%, whatever, to manage the asset, right? At what point a PM becomes just a lease signing agency versus an agency which drives your business and fulfills the, or brings in the clients, right? So how do you track that? How do you monitor that? Yes, it's very important because the profit is right there in the last seven, eight, nine, ten 10% of occupancy. How do you make the PM accountable for what you are doing, you're paying them for? That's, that's my question. Yeah, you, you set expectations up from the very beginning. I mean, we've had to explain like, hey, you're doing a good job, but you know, Kyle and I are gonna keep pushing, 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 you know, to make sure she knows like, hey, we're, we're all in this together, you know, how do, and, we, and we've broken things down so that they can see and understand and and I think Dave appreciated it tremendously to, because they never looked at it that way and, 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 and saw the effect of, you know, how one thing affects another, uh, affects another. And now she's on board and it took some training to do, uh, you know, cause she's been doing this a, a long time, but she's game and she's up for the challenge, you know? So it's, it's exciting to see her part of the process and, um, implementing some of these strategies that, that we've kind of, you know, talked with her about. Let me, add two more, let me add two more items to it. Do you go, like, for example, if it's a heavy crowded street that you mentioned, right? Do you go in detail, okay, in this location, we're going to put flags and wind feathers and banners and lighting. And versus if in suburban, you're going to go all online. Do you guide them? This is what we're going to do. Or they come up with the budget and, hey, I live here. I know this works. We, we usually, um, for the most part, want their input. You know, they know the sub market, great. You know, they know the other properties that they can compare with. Um, but then there are times when we push them outside their comfort zone where they've never done that before. And, and, um, and, and we really have to push them, quite honestly. Um, but we, we want their input. We ask for that first before we give them ours, you know. Um, because it is a partnership and, and, and they've been doing it a long time and, and they bring a lot to the table as well. So you, you want and need their partner, partnership. We're not just dictating. So, um, but we'll tweak things. We'll have some ideas and some of our suggestions work. Some of them don't work to be honest, you know, and we kind of, we work back and forth as a team, you know? Yeah. And it's all about tracking those things. So you don't make the same mistake twice. Right. And, and, Every property is different. If it has heavy traffic driving in front of it every day, then maybe you don't need as much advertisement as you do for a property that's tucked away, not on the main road. So what Gary and I do is before we close on any deal, we actually sit down with the property management company, the renovation team, the marketing team, the GC, and we come up with a full business, full scope of business plan on what things we're going to do. And then week over week on your weekly calls, you adjust on those things based on the results. I mean, no one has the perfect business plan on day one. It's all about pivoting, tracking, and then making those adjustments to continue to improve constantly. And as, as you continue to improve, then obviously your business starts to run more efficiently. But it's all about communication and making sure the property management company knows that you guys are partners, not you're the one dictating it. But you do have to implement systems 
to hold them accountable so that they can see the results and you can track those results. Beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. So value add. Um, again, you're, you're establishing that value add from the very, very beginning, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, branding or better property management, you know, like one of our properties, they had a, um, a single family home property management company managing it. So um, they just weren't doing a, as good a job as, a, as another company could, uh, could be doing. Um, you're looking at, you know, water savings or electricity, you know, savings, you know, all these different things that you can implement, you know, um, if you, if you can, if you could boost your NOI by a thousand dollars a month, um, times 12 months, let's say a cap rate of 6% where, you know, that's pretty generous. That's $200,000 value that you've just created on your property. Now, if you can do 5,000 a month, now that's a million dollars of value that you've created. So things, you know, exponentially, it, you know, grows. Um, so that's, that's pretty exciting. You know, what you can do to your property by keep tweaking and keep adding different things, you know, whether it's, um, you know, uh, a, a, a cable, um, you know, they just plug and play with their cable, whatever it is. And we'll, we'll, we'll at the very end, we have five NOI uh, uh, booster suggestions for you as well. All right, investor relations. So this, this ha has to start even before you have a deal. Um, you gotta be talking about what you're doing, um, making sure people are educated that's part of, part of the uh, you know the, one of the hardest parts you know if people are already doing some real estate then they kind of understand what you're doing but you know i've got some friends that um you know have never invested in real estate don't understand it you know they are in stock so and that 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 takes a while about talking about it you know telling them uh, you know not selling them but telling them what what's going on and then you also have to have con that consistent communication um, before the deal and even after the deal to make sure they're getting all the reports um, and you're building those relationships. All right, curveballs. Uh, and again, we, you know, we're going over these items kind of quickly and then we'll deep dive uh, down the road. But uh, there's always curveballs, whether it's COVID or even something smaller. Um, you know, you're always going to be faced with challenges. So you want to be ahead of the game because when something happens, then it doesn't set you back as far. So when people aren't paying attention to their KPIs or are not, you know, managing their manager, then uh, they're really um, hit hard when, when a curveball comes, whether it's weather related or, you know, disease related, a fire, whatever. Taxes. All right. So um, I mentioned uh, cost segregation, uh, bonus appreciation earlier. Uh, huge benefit when you're investing in a multifamily deal. Each deal is a little bit different. Um, but on our, our last deal, if you invested $100,000, you would have gotten an $82,000 um, loss on your K1. And, you know, if you're a real estate professional, you could take advantage of all of that. If you're not. I, I do. What? 92. Oh, 92. All right. I didn't realize it was that high. I forgot. But, but uh, yeah, it was, uh, it, as a real estate professional, it was pretty stellar. So um, definitely want to take advantage of that. If you're, you're holding it more than a couple of years, um, we didn't end up doing it at one of our properties um, that we, um, we were in escrow to sell it after 14 months. So we, we we knew our business plan shifted and so it just wasn't worth it to to do that process um but you can always go back if if you wanted to and if, if your if your business plan changed was that in year one or throughout the course of the investment sorry go ahead was that lost in year one or throughout the course of the investment lost in year one and you'll recapture it at the end but i mean as a, you know that's that time value of money as you know yeah. So um, I recommend for people that are married and the significant other isn't working and they're investing in real estate for that significant other to get kind of like the, the real estate uh, license to, to sell. And, you know, they're, they're managing the investments and that 
that's a great way if you're investing a lot of money passively it's a great way to reduce your taxes um, you can't take advantage of it as much if you're if you're using your retirement money just something to be aware of all right disposition I mean anytime you buy a property at the I mean you I mean certainly some people's business plans could be hold it forever um, but at some at some point you're gonna you know sell it off and um, timing is key you want to take advantage of market conditions you want to make sure you hold back some extra money for those that may come up because if you disperse all your money and you know you get a, a you know other bills that come in afterwards which will inevitably happen you know you don't want to go back to your investors trying to trying to get money so uh, make sure um, you, you hold back some money and remember that the deal is never done until the day it's closed on the sale. So you could be in, in escrow, you know, a few days before the deal and, and start celebrating, but, um, luckily it hasn't happened to us, but we, we know of other people that it just fell through at the very last second. So, um, weird things happen in real estate all the time. All right. So, um, any questions for the basics of asset management? All right. I bombed through a lot um, really quickly. Kyle and I actually wrote a book on this that will be coming out in a, in a few months, really detailed on, on all these uh, different topics. Um, but certainly we're going to delve into that over the next, next few months as well. All right. Take it away, Kyle. What to look for as an asset manager? All right, go ahead and hit the next button. Um, so these are just some of the things that you should be looking out for as an asset manager. Certainly not all the things, um, but these are the ones that came to mind to me while I was uh, making these slides. And some of this stuff was already talked about, so I'm going to breeze over some of it. But feel free to type in the chat box if you have any questions as well. But you know, being an asset manager really starts with picking the right property management company. And for us, you know, we vetted property management companies for four months before we selected one. Gary and I are very market specific, so we're not that group that invests in five or six different markets. We took the time to really interview and choose our property management company wisely. Um, we probably vetted it 10 to 12 and narrowed it down to two or three. And uh, by the end of it, you know, they kind of self eliminate themselves a little bit. And then you have to pick the last kind of three or four. We really liked the flexibility of our property management company, the communication, the transparency, but also they had uh, infrastructure, right? So they had a corporate team, uh, marketing team, construction team, in-house GC to manage the rehabs and an accounting team. So these things may not seem like a big deal, but they're a huge deal when you're managing multiple properties and really managing these larger properties. There's a lot of mom and pop uh, property management companies out there that don't have this infrastructure. And once you've had a property management company with solid infrastructure, you're gonna quickly realize how important it is. I mean, you've got teams helping your property be marketed and making sure construction goes well. If you've ever had to, Gary touched on this earlier, if you've ever had to hire out and manage a construction team and a GC on your own as an asset manager, I mean, it's a headache, trust me, especially if you're doing it out of state. So we love the fact that our property management company has in-house GC and an in-house rehab team. Now they outsource some things, but they're the ones managing it. You don't have to manage the schedules and all that. You just have to manage those people. So I think it's really huge to have that infrastructure. Um, and the next level is kind of the field team, right? Do they have regionals? Do they have managers and leasing agents? Um, why that's important is that if it's a mom and pop property manager, they likely do not have any backups. They can't fill in when you have um, uh, a vacancy in your team, right? So if you have a leasing agent that quits, now you're down a person and that likely will not get filled, which then affects your leasing um, unless you can hire a temp. Um, and it just affects the whole operation. I mean, just like with leasing units, your biggest cost is your vacancy. Same thing when it comes to managing your team. The biggest thing you can have is turnover having to retrain someone, get them in, re-understand the property. It's just a lot of work. And so that's the thing you wanna try and avoid at all costs. Having a field team with a regional who's gonna manage that person's a big deal. 
Um, but also we've had vacancies in our uh, turnover and we've had other properties or corporate people fill in those slots. Um, they always have a backup or a rover in their region. So that's key. And then with infrastructure comes systems, right? So if you have a mom and pop property management company, they likely don't have any type of training program. They don't have any standard operating procedures and they certainly probably don't track KPIs. These are all things that yes, we do as well as far as KPIs, but we want our property management company to do as well. So um, you wanna make sure that your property management company has solid infrastructure and has these things in place or else as an asset manager, you're gonna be even doing more of the heavy lifting and likely you know, struggle within the first six to 12 months to get them trained. You can hit the next slide, Gary, or the next button. All right, how deep do you dig into your monthly financials? This is something that I'm like addicted to and I probably dig in too deep into our monthly financials. But you know, if you're trusting your property management company when they send you that your T12 and your monthly financials and you just review the high level summary of them and that's it, I guarantee you you're missing money and you're, and you're losing money on your bottom line. These people are human. They're gonna make mistakes. They're gonna code things incorrectly. They're gonna double charge things. They're gonna miss things. And so, uh, and these accountants have multiple properties um, for the most part. So they're managing multiple properties. I had a $10,000 charge to our small 42 unit property that was coded to the wrong property. If I had not audited it and found that, it would have just been 10K less to our bottom line. And there's nothing I could have done about it, right? So you've got to audit them. So track line by line uh, over past 12 months to identify trends, that's KPIs. We track all those things to identify whether, you know, has plumbing, have plumbing costs gone up in the last three months? What's causing that? Do we have a leak? Um, you know, have HVACs kind of gone out of control? Do we need to do some deferred maintenance work on them? Things like that. Um, utilize your general ledger to, I, to find incorrect charges or poor spending habits. That's the general ledger to me is really where I dig in and I get to see every account and I get to see exactly what was spent in those accounts. I get to see how the things are being accrued. Um, and that's really important. I often find things that are charged twice on accident or things that didn't get charged that need to get charged or they spent, you know, we had, we had one of our properties spend $1,200 on ink for a printer. It's ridiculous. That's ridiculous. Right. And so they said, Oh, we bought for six months. Well, when you're trying to control expenses, you want to make sure that you're spending, you know, uh, smart and you, and you want to spend every month, not stock up for a year, especially going through COVID when you're trying to protect your bottom line. So those things are going to be identified when you're digging in. Again, if you're just looking at the income statement and which is a summary, you're not going to see these things because all you're going to see is repairs and maintenance, you know, $2,000 marketing, $2,000. Well, what is in those two thousand dollars? You know, was it twelve hundred dollars of ink, or are these legitimate charges? Uh, check your balance sheet monthly to understand your cash position. Extremely important to understand your cash position. I mean, this is not something that uh, you should take lightly. And if you're not looking at your balance sheet, you really don't understand your cash position. Just because you know what how much money you have in the bank in your bank account does not mean you understand your cash position. Because you have assets and liabilities that are hitting every month. And if you are accruing bad debt or not accruing bad debt or have a lot of receivables, you know, all those things affect your cash position. So those are things you need to keep track of. You don't need to dig into them every month very deeply, but you know, when you know your cash position and you know where your receivables and payables should be, make sure you're checking your balance sheet on that. So you can see or identify when there is an issue. Uh, we have a question from Kanal. Who owns the bank account, the entity or the PM? Great question. This depends on the market, actually. Unfortunately, in Arizona, the property management company cannot assign us rights to the account. Um, I don't know the exact wording on that. We actually tried to be signers on our property management's account, but they would not let us. So what we do is we have two separate bank accounts, one that we control and one that our property management company controls. And we only uh, transfer capital funds over to them for enough to complete the next 60 to 90 days of projects. Um, other than that, we have our own balance uh, in another bank account that we control. That's huge because if, you know, you're switching over property management companies, unfortunately things happen and sometimes you have to do that. They can hold back all that money because there are still bills to be paid. And so you could be short a ton of money or 
you know, your money can be locked up for three, four, five months until the property management company releases it. So it's important to either have signing rights to your accounts so you can get that money out or have separate accounts where, you know, they don't have access to all that money. I mean, the most we put in there is a couple hundred thousand and that's when we're in the value add stage, spending quite a bit of money on our properties. Once we're stabilized, you know, most of our money is going to be in the alternate bank account where we have access to. Do you usually uh, sign uh, issues on a ledger every month? And is it usually small charges or? Every month. There's every not month. It goes by that I don't have at least a question, you know, on what's going on here or there. And it could be even as simple as, as things uh, being coded to the wrong account, which when you're selling a property, it's actually really important because the lender's looking at what you're what the market spend per line item is. And if it's above that, it draws red flags sometimes. So, um, you know, thinking that far ahead, you really need things to go on the right line items. Is your asset management fee going above the line or below the line? It really should go below the line because above the line, it's affecting the NOI. Um, and an asset management fee is not charged in every situation. So that should go below the line. So it's things like that. Um, I would say after you've worked with a property management company, and they know how you like to see your financials, it improves, but it is never perfect. There are always things to question. Um, and, you know, it is tough if you don't understand. It. it took me a while to get it, how accruals work and all that kind of stuff. But being able to check to make sure things are accrued properly is really important. You know, you can go back four or five months and find two charges that, that were supposed to be accrued, um, but they never were. So uh, there's not a month that goes by that I don't find at least a couple hundred dollars um, to bring to our bottom line. Yeah. Do you guys have them pay the mortgage or, or do you guys pay it? They, they pay it. It's, it's an auto pay to be honest, but they make sure it gets paid. Okay. Yep. And is that more so they can report it? Um, it just streams line, it streamlines it for us. I mean, I, we're yeah. trying to take all those things off of our plate. If they can do it and it's done efficiently, then there's no reason that you should have to worry about that getting paid, you know, it's out of our bank account that's or their bank account. Um, but it's just like the same thing as uh, having an in-house GC, you know, it takes certain things off of our plate so we can focus on the, on the things that really matter. I mean, paying your mortgage matters, right? But you shouldn't have to worry about it. You can have your property management company do that. Yeah. Uh, what tools are you using to review your ledger? Is PM using online cloud platform or they send monthly reports? So, you know, our property management software is Yardi, so we have access to Yardi, so I can pull reports at any time, even right now. Um, but they do also send us monthly reports. As far as a tool to review the ledger, I review it myself and then I make my notes and send it back to them. Uh, but we track everything right now in Google Drive. We also have our KPI dashboard, which we use RealPage for, um, that gets auto uploaded into that. And then every week we get, or sometimes daily, depending on the KPI, um, we get access to, to those changing KPIs. All right, uh, next on the list is uh, lead conversion. Oh, go back, Gary. Yep, uh, LASL system. So we obviously stole this from Neil Bauer, if, every, if anyone knows. And, um, you know, we consider him a friend and uh, he's, he's someone that we really respect and um, really love to learn from. And so this is one of the things that we learned from him. Um, and it's, it's tracking the conversions of each stage of lease up, not just tracking hey, we have 30 leads today or this week and we converted one. Well, that doesn't really tell you much. Where is the bottleneck happening? That is what asset management is all about, identifying exactly where the bottleneck is happening. And you know, the only way to do that is to break things down. And so leads to appointments. How many leads turned into appointments? How many appointments turned into showings? How many showings into applications? How many into leases? The reason why that's important, again, if you only have 30 leads and you know you have one uh, lease, you don't know where the issue is, but if you know you had 30 leads and only two appointments, one showing and zero leases, well, now you know your bottleneck is in leases to appointments. So whether that's, hey, we're not getting back to them quickly enough, our leasing agents not doing their job, or maybe they're just not strong leads. So we need to increase our marketing to get better leads. Um, so at least you know where to have to start that conversation now. Um, and if it's, you know, if it's leads to appointments is 29 out of 30, and then you're getting one lease, now you know you may have to switch out your leasing agent. They're just not closers. So having the right person in there is just as important. So identifying those bottlenecks is really important. And it 
saves you time as an asset manager because you get to understand where you're going quicker or what the issue is. And it also helps the property management company improve. I mean, we have seen our leasing operations improve week over week, month over month, as we help them out with this and really show them the results, right? It's not just about telling them, it's about showing it to them um, so that they can better understand. And ultimately it makes their job easier, which is our goal as well. Um, two more, how much are you spending per lead and top sources, converted leads and dollars spent? So we track all those things to understand where our best bang for our buck is, right? If we're only getting one lead a week that turns into zero leases on apartments.com where we're spending $600 a month, but on Craigslist, um, you know, we get five leads a week and we close on two a week, well, we're gonna put more effort into Craigslist. Um, and that's one example of one of our properties, but um, there's so many different marketing platforms, you can spend a ton of money on them, but you don't know where you're really getting results from unless you're tracking the dollar per converted lead along with you know, how much those sort, if you're breaking it down by source as well, it's not just, hey, we're spending 2000 overall and we're paying $10 a lead. You wanna break it down for each source so you know, you know what your conversions is for apartments.com, Craigslist, Zillow, et cetera. All right, next page. All right, leasing agent or manager response time and actual response to leads. This is something that Gary kind of touched on, but we do monthly shopping audit. I call them a shopper report because that's what my past company called them, but they're basically audits on our property. So I set up an alternate email um, every month and I go on the online platform, whatever it is, whatever I choose that week and I email them and I ask them certain questions and I track the timing in which they respond. You know, do they respond within 24 hours? Do they respond in 48, 72? If you're not responding within 24 hours, that lead is probably dead. You know, um, when I'm looking for apartments, I email 10 or 20 of them and I go with the top three or four that get back to me. So um, that's really important. And then what does that response look like? Is it copy and pasted? Is it answering any of your questions? You know, I always ask a very specific question. Do you have top floor available or do you have an elevator? Do you allow pets? Um, I want a one bedroom. And sometimes we'll get a response that says, hey, do you need a one or two bedroom? Well, I asked for a one bedroom. So they're obviously not reading it. They're just hitting reply and then copy and pasting. So it's really important to work with the team on that to make sure that they're, look, they're actually responding and trying to add value. This is one thing that, you know, as real estate syndicators, we always try to add value to other people. And as a, an apartment lease, uh, agent, you want to add value to your residents before it's even time for them to move in. And they feel like that's the place they want to live, right? Because you're added value before. So we have a preset email template that our property managers fill out or send out. It is copy and paste, but they're to adjust it based on the, uh, the inquiry that comes in. But we also provide links to local shops, resources, schools, things like that. So people get to know the area and trying to add value back to people. So um, really important. Do you guys ever send a secret shopper to the actual office? So we don't do that, but our property management company does that once a quarter. It is something that we would want to eventually do. It's a great idea. Um, we also have someone call in and have a conversation over the phone to see what yeah. that's like. Do they answer the phone? Is there a way to leave a message? How quickly do they call you back? And are they friendly? Uh, we have not sent someone in in person quite yet, but uh, it is a good idea. And if you can do that, it's, you know, I'd suggest that maybe you only do that once a quarter versus once a month. But yeah. then you know, we share these results with our property management company and we talk through how we can improve. Right yeah, I think, that, I think you could hire people to do that too, right? There's like a website or something out there. I mean, there's TaskRabbit and things like that where you can hire people to, to do quick quick things like that. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. We, we've created the uh, dummy emails and dummy, you know, phone numbers and had family members call. And <laughs> yeah. Or someone you know in the area, go walk it. I don't know. <laughs> yep, absolutely. All right. Average rent per unit compared to your budget. So just like with uh, tracking leads, you know, you want to know, are you achieving your target rents for each unit type? And, you know, we know that our average per unit, we want $1,200, right? But that's on the two bedrooms. And on the one bedrooms, we want 1025 
only way to really see where you're hurting is to track each individual unit type and see how far behind you are, right? So right now we know on one of our properties, we had to lower the rents a bit on the two bedrooms because there's more exposure in the market for renting of two bedrooms right now, but one bedrooms, we can't keep them, um, we can't keep them vacant. I mean, that we could try to, and, and there's just so much demand for them. So if we're not tracking that kind of stuff, we wouldn't know, hey, right now, we have zero exposure on one bedrooms. Anytime a one bedroom comes up, we're gonna charge 70 bucks more or a hundred bucks more per unit because we can right now. Um, and so that's, that's the benefit of breaking things down. Um, you know, are you trending up or down each unit type? I just talked about that. Do you need to change your business plan and achieve your target rents? Um, and what I mean by that is things like, do you charge rubs or not? We actually did a rubs comp, which I had never done before. We found out our, our rubs were $15 under what the market was providing. So not just looking at rent comps, looking at rubs comps because that can make up the difference in some areas, which it did on our two bedrooms where we had to lower our rents, but we can actually raise our rugs, right? So- How do you um, check that if they don't mark it or put that on the like apartments.com? company will call uh, our competitors and ask and secret shop them, so- Got it, okay. You do. Um, or do you need to completely change your business plan and, you know, stop implementing or, you know, one of the things Gary and I always do is we try and push a little bit further. Can we save a little bit of money on interior renovations with being able to get the same amount of rents, you know, things like that. So your business plan, like Gary said, is not static. It is ever changing. It's a flowing, moving uh, plan. You know, every week we talk about how we can improve and make things different. So always know that there's room to improve and keep pushing on that and never think that, Hey, this is our plan. We've got to stick to it if things aren't working. Okay. And then let's see process and length of time for unit turns and rehabbing units. Gary talked about this a lot earlier too. You know, renovation management is a beast, especially when you have larger properties and you're putting in 15, $20,000 per unit um, with, with washers and dryers making sure not only those units look good, but they're being turned efficiently. You know, are things being ordered or are we waiting three days and we can't turn the unit because we didn't order them in advance well enough or because the renovation team didn't hand it over to the leasing agent when they should have. Um, all those different things, they add up. And if, if each, process, each step takes three extra days, you're looking at you know 10 to 12 extra days that is a lot of money to your bottom line so we track the average unit turn how long does that take you know and that's just a simple turn where the person moved out and you're just turning it you're keeping all the the uh, fixtures and everything as is um, no huge turns maybe you're replacing just flooring but cleaning it up and then how long does an average interior renovation take a full renovation you know one that we're spending 16 grand on include including the washer dryers, how long does that take on average? When we know the average, we're always trying to push it one or two days quicker. What's the process of ordering? Can we order more in advance, use storage? And so can we improve that by three days? And so that's kind of something that we've been able to do and, and do it successfully. And not all, like Gary said, not all the time does it work, but you always wanna be testing how you can improve your processes. Because if you can take your renovations from 28 days to 21, now all of a sudden, maybe you can do one or two more units per month, but you can certainly get residents in sooner, right? Which helps the bottom line. Uh, are you able to implement a system to create more efficiency and cut down the downtime? So I just talked about that. Last one for me here, Gary. So keys to asset management, the things that come to mind for me, trust but verify. You don't want your property management company, you know, only responsible for running the ship. You've always got to verify that they're doing the things they're saying they're doing. Um, track KPIs to measure and identify bottlenecks and always follow up. The devil's in the details and it's all about follow up. I think there's too many times people don't follow up. They, they agree to get something done with their property management company. They expect it to get done and that's the end of that and they never follow up. And then the next time they're at the property, it's like, hey, we talked about this six months ago. It's not done yet. Oh yeah, I forgot. So you've wasted six months. And so you've got to track those things. You've always got to follow up. And whether it's just in Excel, Word, or we use Google Drive right now, um, where we can have, we have a tab every week, you know, and we go back to that previous tab, we review everything that we talked about in that, that tab to make sure we're following up. And then we go to the new list. Um, and so 
that's crucial. I think that more than anything is the number one thing for asset management with me. And that's it. So if you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box. Gary has a little bit more. I know we're running a little long here. So Gary will run through those slides and then we'll do some networking. So, so you guys just track stuff on like Google Sheets. You don't have any like software or project management kind of stuff that you use? KPIs, we use RealPage and that's a dashboard of all of our KPIs. We've got over 50 KPIs that we track. Um, so that's where the bulk of that is. And then obviously we have reporting, but as far as our notes and things like that and conversations with our property management company, we could use a CRM, but we use a Google drive because we have more teammates that can just pop in and take a look at it. And it's just worked for us. Yeah. Um, so does real page hook up to Yardi then? It does. It syncs with Yardi. There's an integration. Okay. What's the real page product that you guys use? Um, shoot. I don't even know. It's their, it's their KPI BI. Oh, it's their BI dashboard, business intelligence dashboard. Okay. And uh, if you want to email me, happy to send you and, and hook you up with them. Cool. Uh, yes. Yeah, sorry for all the questions. I just closed on a 72 unit last week in Oklahoma city and I'm, nice, I'm digging into all this stuff. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Happy to help any way I can. So yeah. Uh, All right, so we promised we'll give you five ways to boost NOI and some of these, I mean, none, none of this is, is um, you know, um, out, of, out of the blue, but the water saving. So, um, you know, you can uh, change your shower heads, your faucets, your toilets, to save, save a lot of money. There's also some different things. We're just trying this uh, thing called the flow saver. And so what it does is, uh, um, it takes the air bubbles out of the, of the, the pipe, I guess. Right, Kyle? Like, yeah, exactly. So it reduces the airflow and, and a lot of what you pay for in your water bill is, is air, um, in, in the lines. And so what it does is it takes that out, it removes it, um, and therefore it reduces your usage, um, and reduces your water bill overall. They can save between 10 and 30%, depending on how large the lines are if the pipes are half an inch or inch and a half, two inches, three inches. Um, we just, we're just installing that at one of our properties now. Um, and it's free to install. It's just a rev share type of model. So whatever they save, you pay them half. So um, still more to be determined, but we have got heard um, good things about that. What, what is that called again? Sorry. Catch that. Flow Saver, F-L-O-S-A-V-E-R. Flow Saver? Yeah. Okay. F-L-O-S-A-V-E-R. Now, they don't have the best uh, customer service. They're kind of a mom and pop operation. So they do take a while to get back to you, but could be an easy way to save 10 or 20% on your water bill. Also for where we, we have our properties in, in Phoenix and Tucson, it, it's doing some desert scape. You know, if we're looking at a property, we might take out some grass or a lot of shrubbery if we know it's sucking up a lot of water. So that's another way to save some, uh, some money on uh, some water. Add rubs, we kind of talked about it before. You know, um, you know, it's very market specific and, and some market specific depending upon what, if you can charge rubs and, and how much. So you really gotta know your area, but uh, keep shopping it. It's not just a, you know, while you're underwriting the property, you check out rubs. It's a continual thing that you gotta keep checking to see. You know, are rubs moving up? Are they moving down? Charge for covered or assigned parking. Um, some you can add covered parking. It's like fifteen hundred dollars um, a spot, and 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 again, different different markets are 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 different. Um, or you you can charge for assigned parking if you want to, you know, for a, a spot next to, near your unit. You can charge an extra twenty dollars a month, and you know, twenty dollars doesn't sound like a lot, but you know, if you can get, you know, fifty, sixty people doing it multiply it over many, many months and divide it by your cap rate, it, it, every little bit adds up and that's what you wanna keep doing. Find little increment movements up, you know, to boost your NOI. Charge for premium location units. You know, we'll look at properties that, you know, maybe it's, um, it's a, an apartment with a, with a really nice view or by, by the, um, the courtyard. So 
depending upon that, you can you could charge for more. Um, and, you, and you know, conversely, you might charge for less if it's on second or third floor. But look for different ways to keep increasing that NOI. And then the last one, add washer dryers in units. Um, you know, in Phoenix and uh, Tucson, you know, we can get you know seventy five dollars uh, a unit for a washer dryer. So um, your you, the money that you invest could be around thirty five hundred again, market specific. That's coming from your capex, but it boosts the NOI, your your sales price. So the money that you invest, you're gonna you're gonna make you know fivefold, tenfold. All right, what um, do we have any more uh, questions? Yeah, yep. uh, I'll, go and, uh, I'll go ahead and read a couple. Uh, what's the max rubs in Phoenix? The limit? You just can't make money off of it. So let's just say your water, your water sewer trash is a hundred grand. You can't make more than a hundred grand. Um, so there's no max on that. Other than that, um, we did have a good question from Greg Butcher. So. How do you manage your property manager regarding expectations for vacant turn rehab periods before a new tenant moves in? Example, a tenant moves out and a prospective tenant applies to move in six weeks later. When can you, when you can have the unit turned in two weeks? So that's a great question. So what he's basically saying is you've got a vacant unit. Uh, it's going to be ready in two weeks. Someone applies today, but they want six weeks out. They can't move in for six weeks. So essentially you're losing a month of um of time what we do is it, that's a tough question but what we do is we're always talking to our property management company the most we allow is 30 days out so if someone wants to move in today uh, or applies today they've got to have a move-in date of less than four weeks unless our occupancy is such that we can allow for six to eight weeks so it is a little bit of a moving target but we also like to look at move outs like so if today is what they say, the 16th, we actually have five move outs uh, at one of our properties at the end of this month because we're not renewing a couple of people that aren't paying rent. So in that case, we know we're gonna have five additional vacants. Maybe we'll go a little bit further out because we know our exposure is a little bit higher. But in general, if our occupancy is stable at 95%, it's gonna be 30 days uh, maximum on that. Can you add admin or processing fees to rubs? No, you just charge admin and processing fees on uh, upfront. Those are part of your other income. So those are things that the property management company should be charging, um, you know, every time that a, a resident uh, applies for, for a lease. So those are just uh, other charges in the um, other income lines. 